Wherever there's news, there can be fake news. On this day, there's been another mass shooting in the United States, this time at a country music bar in California. Yeah, here, yeah, I'm fine. As far away as London, it's a breaking story. Journalists at BBC World are trying to verify if a photo they've found online of the sheriff killed at the scene is really him. I'm finding a few pictures of him here. So I'm comparing this image here to the one from his Facebook page to try and work out. It's definitely, the definitely right him, person. yes. Why are they so wary? Because the photos could be a hoax posted by people trying to trick news organizations into using them. Increasingly, newsrooms around the world know that when big stories happen, the internet will swell with fake news. You will find a lot of material very quickly on the internet circulating. Um, not all of it will be verifiable. Some of it will be uh, imposter, fakery, um, people who sadly want to plant themselves in the middle of a breaking news story um, for whatever motivation, but were not actually there. Frankel is part of a team of about a dozen journalists here whose job it is to spot the fakes that could be coming from any part of the world. India is one of the countries in the world where um, media manipulation is probably at its most rife at the moment because of the preponderance of WhatsApp. Messages are being passed around in private groups and peer-to-peer, -peer, um, and it's like a series of sort of Chinese whispers. One of those whispers led to panic last summer when floods were devastating parts of southern India. A WhatsApp posting by a man dressed as an Indian army officer suggested rescue efforts in some areas had been halted, but the army says he was an imposter. It became a big problem for them in, in terms of the logistical operation that they were performing. So we did a story about their attempt to get ahead of that. And once a video starts being shared, people tend to assume someone else has checked it out. Consider this video of a female cyclist on a London street being harassed by two men in a van. People loved the way she exacted her revenge. Oh. It was very, very widely shared, um, and a lot of people were saying, have you seen this extraordinary footage of, you know, cyclists giving, giving it um, to, this, uh, to this van driver? But Frankel says his team noticed what seemed not quite right. Where are the other people? Where are the other pedestrians? And there was a motorcyclist behind her that was going quite slowly. We didn't actually do the story because we were concerned about it. They made a good call. Days later, a PR agency fessed up. The video was a cycling safety message. But by then, millions of people had already seen it and believed it was real. What you have to understand is that fakery comes in many forms. It isn't just um, somebody manipulating a photograph. It's also PR uh, agencies trying to um, plant messages in a particular way. It's the mix of marketing, mistakes, and mischief that have made it no longer possible to believe it just because we see it. We no longer live in an age where you can simply report in a linear fashion what is going on. But the fight against fake news doesn't always take so many hands. And I'll turn on the live stream. I feel like we should have snacks or something. Yeah, I know. We usually have I, snacks well, here. I'm sometimes eating dinner, you know, frantically beforehand. Daniel Dale is proof that one person working alone can have an enormous impact fighting fake news. From his small Washington apartment that doubles as his office, this Canadian reporter has quickly become known as one of the best fact checkers in the United States. A lot of the lies that he tells, he's telling them over and over. Oh, there he is. <laughs> Let's turn him up. Don't look at the size of the media back there. That's a lot of people. Donald Trump has been Dale's nearly unrelenting focus. And on this night, Trump is about to hold his last rally before the midterm vote. The audience will be listening for the promises. Dale will be listening for what he considers the lies. I don't think anything I've ever done as a journalist has angered people as much as simply pointing out 
when the president is not telling the truth. Um, in, for his supporters, uh, many of them see it as an attack on him or even as an attack on them. Almost immediately, Dale hears what he says is the first lie of the night. And I've got 1.6 billion, another 1.6 billion, and a third 1.6 billion. I'm building it in ni nice large pieces, but I'd like to build it all at one time. That's, so that's not true. He hasn't gotten any money for the wall. And the 1.6 billion he's gotten so far is for is for other projects. So he's claiming that he has 4.8 billion dollars for the wall when he has 1.6 billion for something else. Dale consults his own database of facts. Then, as he'll do about 50 times on this night, he takes to Twitter to call out Trump. Both men arrived in Washington around the same time, nearly two years ago. Since then, Dale has frequently challenged Trump on his own fake news, keeping a running tally for his readers. We made dozens more. And this is in his time as president? In his time as president. Dale has been willing to do what many journalists still won't, call Trump a liar, making the Toronto Star reporter something of a star in his own right. And I should say, we at the News Hour uh, talk about inaccurate statements, false statements. You're comfortable using the word lie. Why? Because I think that's the only accurate word for some of the claims he makes. His reputation for fact-checking prompted Rolling Stone magazine to put him on their hot list for 2018. And his Twitter followers, about 20,000 when he arrived in Washington, now sits at just under half a million. Daniel, how are you doing it? You must be exhausted checking every single word the president says. I'm a very sleepy man. But the surest sign that Dale's fact-checking is being noticed, he's been blocked on Twitter by no less than the president himself. And he's gotten pushback from Trump's supporters. Sometimes it's pure vitriol, you know, it's racist, it's anti-Semitic, it's homophobic, nothing to do with me, it's just, you know, something about the act of fact-checking gets people, uh, you know, hardcore partisans in a way that nothing else I've done ever, ever has. But some journalists have experienced pushback that's far more serious. Jessica Aro is a reporter in Finland. She investigated a fake news factory operating a few hundred kilometers outside of Helsinki. With a hidden camera, she revealed some young people had been hired to seed pro-Russian propaganda in Finnish social media. But she says once she exposed them, they turned on her. I received phone calls from, for example, Ukrainian phone number, in which there was only the sound of a shooting gun. People were sending me Russian language smears, wishes of me being put into jail. But it didn't end there. It actually only started from there. For the next two years, Aro endured an unrelenting flood of fake stories, memes and websites suggesting she was everything from a NATO operative to a prostitute, to a user of hard drugs and mentally unstable. She says even former friends she hadn't seen in years started to share the articles on Facebook, and there were more death threats. The problem was that it was really difficult for me to estimate which of the threats that I was constantly receiving from the believers of the fake news were actual physical threats to my security. In October, a Finnish court convicted three people for masterminding the smear campaign. But for Aro, the victory was bittersweet. The court couldn't order the big online companies to take the fake stories down. So it all still comes up right away with a search of her name. I learned the hard way, very personally, the worst threat of fake news. And the truth is, the effort to smear her only worked because people are often so willing to share anything they find online. Ask yourself a few basic questions. What do I understand about this video? What do I know about it? What do I know about the author, the uploader, the background, the story context, before you actually come to share it? 